The regular meeting of the Board of Trustees, Smith Vocational Agricultural High School. Today is Tuesday, December 19th, 2023. May I have a call to order? Mr. Kaley. Present. Dr. Spencer Robinson. Here. Mr. Quadro. Present. Dr. Bonner. Present. And Mayor is due to come in. She's just not here yet. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Quadro, may we have a mission statement? Sure thing, Mr. Kaling. Mission statement, Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School to prepare students for social responsibility, employment, and post-secondary education through rigorous applied technical and academic programs. Thank you. Is there any participation by the public this evening? It doesn't appear to be. Cindy, anything? I am good. Okay. Merry Christmas. Participation by the trustees. Julie, please. Yes. Um, you know I'm the uh, district representative to the Collaborative for Educational Services yes. and am required by law to report to you quarterly um, on the activities of the board. Um, so I have just a, a few highlights. The yes. CES newsroom blog is now located on the main website, and it's a good place to learn about the collaborative's work. The Spiffy Coalition continues to send out reports from the results of the 2023 Hampshire County Prevention Needs Assessment Survey. Their website has the reports on youth smoking, vaping, and <coughs> use of prescribed, uh, unprescribed prescription drugs. Hampshire County superintendents had a presentation at their meeting, and I believe it's something our school leaders will be digging into. The SPIFI coordinator is also developing a plan to support schools to implement the newly approved Massachusetts Health Education Curriculum Frameworks. And two CES researchers have been presenting the results of a study conducted on the challenges and benefits of virtual reality in secondary classrooms and implications for equity, diversity, and inclusion. If we want to explore or utilize um, virtual reality, we can request a synopsis of the findings uh, or support with effective implementation to promote equitable access. Um, the two researchers, it's really cool what they've done. They've been doing it for a while, funded by uh, META. Um, so it, I, I know that you have brought that topic to the board and some of us explored it in different um, ways. And it would be a great resource to have um, for the first time. Mr. Prager? I do not have anything at this time. Thank you. Can you hear me? It's very exciting out in the hall. What's going on? Congratulations. May I have a motion a second to approve the minutes of the November 14th Board of Trustees meeting? Second. Aye. Aye. I just want to uh, appreciate again the consensus with which um, our secretary summarizes the discussion about longer meetings <laughs> and accurate, thorough. I'm going to turn the meeting over to our superintendent for some information. Yeah, so the school spotlight, uh, we're going to take a slight detour from what you see on your agenda. Uh, unfortunately, Ms. Hughes. Uh, caught a bug or caught something. She was in, not in school today and, and she fell off. Uh, but just to give a little bit of background, and Mr. Bianca can give more detail, uh, but then we're going to shift gears to another presentation. Uh, but Ms. Hughes is part of Project 351. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody on the board is familiar with Project 351. Uh, it's a student-led group. Uh, they're very active with the Superintendents Association and all down to the cave every summer. But Project 351, the 351 represents uh, the 351 communities in the, in the Commonwealth. And the goal is to have a, a student representative in each of the communities. And they come together throughout the year. Uh, it's a great team building, great leadership, obviously, for the, for the students. But they really focus on uh, community service, uh, equity work, diversity work, 
And uh, it's always one of the highlights I have when I go to the superintendent's conference to talk to the students and listen to the students in a presentation. So uh, we're very fortunate to have our first student rep with Project 351. That was Lily. She was going to talk to you uh, this evening about uh, her work with the, uh, with the project. And specifically, she was doing, she did a, uh, a food drive here on campus. So that was the presentation. So unfortunately, we moved out on that. But with that said, I do want to turn to uh, have a presentation from Chef Lacey and Miss Evangelista. Um, just to give you a little bit of background here, uh, a couple months ago they came forward to the administration uh, and looking into the possibility uh, of an international tour uh, for our students. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you have had the opportunity, whether in high school or as an adult, to participate in an international tour. Uh, but this is my first experience here at Smith having this conversation come up. Uh, I had some background in my previous school. Uh, talking about international trips. We had a pre-meeting with EF Tours, uh, which is the, the travel company that we're looking at. The interesting thing here, and again, I don't want to steal the thunder, uh, this particular tour uh, that we're looking at is really targeting agriculture and culinary, uh, which would be ideal for, obviously, as a vocational school. Uh, so that's why I, I think Mr. Bianca and I, we, we had some initial interest, and we had an initial tour with EF, an initial meeting with EF Tours, Asked a lot of, I think, very pointed and valid questions. Uh, we felt comfortable at that point to move forward. Uh, unfortunately, the timing, okay, I'm going to apologize with, with the timing with these meetings. Uh, we were hoping to get this on the actual agenda for the board to vote on this particular uh, trip. That did not happen. Uh, I want to thank these two potential chaperones if this moves forward. Uh, they are trying to plan a parent meeting, an informational parent meeting in January. Uh, that meeting would happen before the January board meeting. So my hope tonight is that these two can present to you kind of you know what the trip would be, uh, what would be entailed, uh, sort of the costs and the expectations and so on and so forth. Uh, see if there's at least a lukewarm receptance uh, from all of you, and uh, be no vote. Uh, but that would at least allow them to move forward, hold the parent meeting in January, see if there's truly some valid interest from the families. And at that point, we would not open up any registration, we would not be receiving any money, nothing like that, uh, until the January board meeting. Uh, at that point, you know, and, and more back and forth, do an official uh, vote from the board in January, and then move forward. So that's sort of the idea. So I do apologize kind of out of context and out of order a little bit, but we thought it was valid to get in front of the board this evening, share the information, maybe answer any initial questions, and see where we are without coming in. So with that said, two you you're up. Okay. Um, so yeah, this came across my computer, I don't know, October-ish, and I was like, hey Joe, can we do this? He's like, well, let's talk. <laughs> uh, so, but you know, I mean, we've looked into it, we have talked with the company that provides this. Uh, we've talked with many different teachers, uh, Nelson and Joe and I have all actually sat down. We talked with North Fork Agricultural High School. They do this. Uh, I think, did they say they do a trip a year just about, but they plan yeah. it two years out in advance. Um, so, and all the schools, all the teachers I've talked to that do this, uh, and I, when I was at the National FFA Convention, I talked to teachers from across the country that have done this. They validate it. They say this is a great opportunity and it's a really good trip. Uh, so we brought forward, we did the survey, and you can, do you want to, yep, and so then we did a survey. Uh, Joe sent out a survey for us, and if so, you know, we've got 23% of the people that took the survey from, or 23% of the people are their kids or they are from 2025, the class of 2025. So there, there was it. Who was surveyed? Uh, so this was the whole parent and student. So we were looking yeah. population. So, yeah, we were looking at um, we're looking at a, a potential tour in 2025. So right. current seniors were not uh, eligible, right. so they weren't polled. So parents and students were sent the survey to just judge interest level. So that went to current juniors, sophomores, and freshmen. And correct me if I'm wrong, but um, we would also be opening this to next year's ninth graders. Correct. Yep. Um, and they were not polled, obviously, because we don't have that data yet. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so we had a really good response, I think, to the poll for the number of students that we have here. Uh, 
and we weren't originally going to do the class of 2025, but talking to other teachers, they said they've got a lot of really good students that probably would want to do this and benefit from it if they have the funds. So we surveyed them as well, uh, and you can see that we kind of we have a good population there that's interested. So those oh, go back, do sorry. those bars represent do, what? What were they? So, asked and what were they? Uh, so 23% of the people surveyed were from the class of 2025, or either parents oh, or gotcha. students. So this is just a number. That's just a number of respondents, of respondents from mm -hmm. each class. Okay, gotcha. 2025, 2026, and 2027, each class. And so that's combining students and parents. Yes, yes. It, it did combine students and parents. Uh, interested in the tours. So out of everybody that took the survey. 68.8% said yes, so I would, if you want to say it's almost double because parents and students took it, then I'd say you got about 30 or so percent of parents are actually really interested in sending their children, uh, which is still a... Well, well the, raw numbers, that, the raw numbers don't support right. assumption. Right. It's, it's a little right. so, hard. So the percentages would probably still stand because many of the same parents and students responded Right. Yes, they both responded yes. So the percentages are still fairly accurate. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. It's like weird. I yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, I say we definitely we have the interest. The interest is out there. I'll tell you my students after the survey and all that. I keep hearing, "Are we going to Italy? Are we going to do Italy? I want to go to Italy. I'm already putting money in the bank. We better go to Italy." That, that's literally some of the things I've been hearing about this. I definitely received several emails from uh, and, my sophomore class yes. and even some of my juniors um, from the parents, yep. you know, asking questions to. about it already, saying. Yes. I would love to do this. Can parents come? Can yeah, no, family come? No. And I've even you gotten know, emails from parents I don't know and, who and they are. And we kind of pump the brakes a little bit until we know where we stand. Right. Um, but there, there does seem to be an overwhelming um, number of parents and students interested in this to meet the need of the minimum requirement for us to pull this off. Which is yes. what? Yes. Um, so minimally, we're looking for at least 12 students. Um, ideally, we'd like to see 18 or more. Um, but I think realistically, we're, we're based on our population and our enrollment here at Smith, um, 12 to 18 is a realistic number for us, yeah. so um, again, at least to start. Out of the 106 or 109 respondents, roughly half of those are students, you think? Roughly, roughly. approximately. Roughly. Yep. It's not, I can't say for sure how many were So students. 50 or so students. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so... Is it affordable? It's so in order if parents, families sign up for this, they can do monthly payments. Uh, roughly, it's going to be around three hundred and three or three hundred thirty-three dollars a month um, if we do the twenty twenty-five tour. For how many months? For eighteen months. So they would be able to do payments. They can, and the money doesn't go through the school. The money goes directly into the EF tours. So the parents pay them. It, and they automatically, they can just have it withdrawn from their checking or debit account, credit account, um, automatically, or they can choose to do their own payment monthly and go in and pay. We, we would also be, um, if this was approved, we would be looking at uh, monthly meetings with the students yes. that were interested, um, monthly fundraisers, uh, long-term fundraising goals to help offset those costs and also to help students raise money for spending money while they're in Italy. Yep. One thing that uh, teachers did advise is that we have spending money while we were in Italy. Um, you know, we're going to be in Italy, so I'm sure there's some gelato we're going to want to have and stuff like that. Um, so they did advise we do need, want to, we need to bring spending money with us. Uh, just for a large group, sit down, have some ice cream or gelato or whatever. Yeah, I, I think it was one of those questions that came up um, during our conversation with the other teachers and mm -hmm. administrators that have done this in the past. EF Tours is kind of, you know, they're trying to sell it, and I think they do a great job. Everything that I've heard and researched on mm -hmm. that is fantastic. Um, but the teacher said the one fallback is that they don't really promote that uh, students should have uh, enough spending money. Yeah. Um, that that's one thing that we should focus on. So yeah. that's something that we've identified. We would probably want to help fundraise for, mm -hmm. um, in addition to offsetting the the maybe the monthly costs or the final mm -hmm. costs. Yep. So we want to do some fundraising to bring in so that we'll have that spending money, and then we're going to do we'll have fundraising uh, mandatory ones that 
we'll take that money and the we can send a check into EF Tours. They will take the check, they'll deposit, they're gonna put it into an basically an account which I then have to go into and say and disperse it evenly among each student. So therefore if we want to say, hey, you know, this was mandatory, kid A did it, kid B did it, but kid C didn't do it, I can take and split it 50-50 between kid A and could be, but could see wouldn't get it if they decided to. Skip. One of the one of the considerations I want to make sure that we mention about fundraising was also so that we could open this up to the less fortunate, yes. to the families that might not be able to afford that three hundred dollar um, bill every month. Um, you know, if we have a, a student that really wants to do this that doesn't have the means, you know, as, as chaperones, as um, advisors for this trip we'd be willing to work with them to help them come up with even independent fundraising opportunities um, to try and raise the money to be able to do this on their own. Yeah. I, I just want to say EF Tours wasn't able to, uh, it all depends on how far out you are and what the cost is. So I know that they're saying 300 or 330, but if the tour is about $4,500 and we're 20 months out, you know, then you're looking at $225. So there is a difference of sliding mm -hmm. scale based on that. So we mm -hmm. don't know yet. They'll, They'll have a better idea once And, and to build on that, January depending on when students parents. sign up, you know, if this stays open to next year's ninth graders, I know I know. right now the price is X, but come January 1, it, it goes up. And come September or October, when, you know, there's yeah. a, a new slew of students that might be interested, that price would be different then as well. Yeah, whatever the cost is divided by the number of months mm -hmm. that they can pay. There's also EF Tours offers um, social... Uh, social media crowdsourcing funding so they can send out links and people can donate in towards mm -hmm. their, their yeah. trip too. Similar to like snap rays which we yeah. use here on campus. So before. they'll have like their own little account and they can people can go in and donate money to it and I've never used it. I don't know really how it works but hey you know we can learn. Um, <laughs> yeah, and most yeah. of that is. And trying to make it easy on Crystal too, so it's just one check that would have to get sent out to EF Tours rather than sending out like an individual check to the kids to help them pay. We can just put it right into their account from EF Tours. So, oh, quick question. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, as you're preparing for kids to have spending money, you also should consider also tipping. Yes. Because some of the tours. They're, they're always expecting a tip, so maybe mm -hmm. as, a, as a team, the team could handle it so the kids are not coming out of pocket yes. to do that. Mm -hmm. And then um, insurance, travel insurance is important. That's it's all in there. Yeah, it's all included. And is yeah. this the week that you're planning to travel? Is that during um, spring yes. break? Yes, yes, yes. That's good. Okay. And quickly tell us about how you're intertwining this um, with farming and okay. No, I got I so got a whole bunch here. So keep we going. Let you finish. Keep going. Keep going. Go. I got a whole bunch here. Questions. <laughs> That's the fundraising. <laughs> There's the cost. Um, there is so this is all of the cost of, of essentially how much per student it's gonna um, be. So right now it's they have if you're under 20, they we're not bringing past. We're not bringing graduates. We're not bringing kids that are over, you know, that age, um, but there is another pricing for kids that are over the age of 20, we're not going there. Um, <clears throat> and right now the plan is not to take parents unless needed for special needs. Um, we don't plan to bring parents, sometimes they can be more of a chap needing a chaperone than being helpful. So. Well, we think that it, yeah, would, it would help keep the group cohesive, too. So it wouldn't yes. be like, you know, family A and family B yes. kind of feeling like they're on their own family vacation. We, we want this to be wrapped around education mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. tie it into what we do here on our campus. Yep. Um, so the whole price, that is our round fare trip that provides all of the hotels with private bathrooms, breakfast and dinner. Uh, full-time tour director, so there's always a tour director with us, uh, and then the, all the activities and attractions that we go to, they take care of all of that for us. They do all of the planning. Uh, we just basically have to show up, <laughs> which yeah, so, is nice. So the initial itinerary would be completely covered 
and paid for yes. by EF tours. You know, maybe with the exception of minus and tipping. That's yes. a good question that we should ask next time we meet is with uh, EF tours, is do they tip these companies or is that something that we need to consider? Yep. Uh, they, they have mentioned that there is some downtime here and there where they squeeze in other things that are not in that itinerary based on the group wants and needs and the time available. Um, that would all be additional and that's where we're talking about raising out of pocket money um, so that the students might not have to like come up with money on the fly if we decided to stop for ice cream or something mm -hmm. that wasn't on the tour or if there was uh, a, a, any number of different things that might come up in the locations that we're at. Buy some really good mozzarella cheese, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yes. As far as the trip being bonded, where these guys, I know everybody is saying they're, they're really good and you feel good and all that. Sometimes these trips go Dixie mm -hmm. and, and a lot of disappointed people, uh, plus the money goes out the window. Mm -hmm. So my biggest concern, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you're all thinking about that, is to protect us, protect you, protect the kids. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm sure they have a great reputation. But yeah. I'm just saying that that's a concern. So uh, at some point, continue on and see. I got some stuff. I think we fast stuff. forward to the Y and then backtrack okay. to the. Yeah. So the cost of chaperones, uh, that we already covered this. Basically, we want eight, uh, 12 students minimum. That covers two chaperones. We'd like 18. That will allow for a third person, uh, a nurse or a parent for a student with special needs. So there's that. Next one. Safety first, so uh, all adult travelers will have a background check, whether or not, because we could end up with, or we most likely, if we're small enough, end up with another school. Just so everybody knows, every single adult is background checked, not just by the school themselves. Uh, I'd like to think other schools are doing background checks, but EF Tours does a full comprehensive background check at no additional uh, charge to any adult. Um, the tour guide is with, with you at all times, uh, they're bilingual, they can translate, all of that good stuff. If a child becomes ill, EF Tours will coordinate and facilitate and support services and logistics including translation services, connection with local, local health care providers, uh, that should be a C there, communication with family, uh, and flights home to no additional cost. Uh, if travelers become unsafe, if travels do become unsafe, something happens. Uh, you never know what's going to happen in the world. There is insurance uh, for funds being returned. I believe that families can do optional additional insurance uh, for a higher return on their investment. Do you yeah. have more? So. Yeah, so that was, that was definitely <laughs> talked about, that there is an option for mm -hmm. families to sign up for. That I, I forget, I think it was up to a month prior yes. to, does that sound right, Joe? It, it was up yeah, to 30 a, days prior. You, you could back out, or it might have been up to the last minute. Right, and then... So I think it was like 30 days. 48, 48 hours or something. It, some it certain was certain something things. like that. It, yes. it, was, it was really right up to the yes. wire. You could back yes. out for any reason and be refunded the majority of your investment yes. at that point in time. Yeah. Um, that question had come up. We were talking about that because we were worried about the kid that maybe raises 75% of the money but has trouble coming up with the rest. What, what happens to that kid that now has paid all this money that worked really hard and, and all of a sudden can't do it? Um, you know, hopefully, you know, as advisors, we're, we're not going to let that happen. We'll be able to come up with ways to help that individual raise those funds. But, um, you know, also you've got the student that ends up having a death in the family or any number of other unexpected And they do allow things. swap outs, so somebody can come into that. They they yes. yeah. The other thing that EF Tours talked about was like if travel does become unsafe, mm -hmm. the, the first thing that they talk about is can we shift the date? Can we move this? Keep it what it is. Keep the same group, but just adjust the time frame. Can we move somewhere else? You know, and that would obviously be something that would come back to the board and the administration um, for, you know, obviously separate consideration mm -hmm. if we ended up in one of those extreme situations. Um, Obviously, this is something that's happened through COVID. I think that um, it's a they they've gotten more comfortable with those shifts during that time frame. But I don't know if it was very quickly. Will you help with the logistics of getting kids passports? 
So that is, that is not um, necessarily on us. It's obviously something that we would talk about with them, but they would have to do that on their own with their families. You know, certainly I know I'd be willing to talk them through the process, give them presentations and printouts on where and how and the cost to do that. Right, and um, speaking, send the families home. I think that's the something list that we have to obviously talk about more. Done, so that would be but, part of the, the planning EF tours as a as so the, the information that you know. not that's part of the cost. If yeah. that, no, that I know, but I was just thinking but. of a uh, student population who may be mm -hmm. going, and if you, you know, you just think about the logistics of how, yep. how do you navigate right. that. I think in helping them navigate it, we can definitely help them with. I mean, yeah. obviously, we're not we're not going to be bringing them anywhere, but. We can help them navigate it, especially in our meetings, uh, and sending home emails with parents to parents saying, here's how this is going, this is places you can go, this is how you sign up, sign up quick because the wait can be long, so. Mm -hmm. Although it does sound like they just got back on track, I was just listening to this on the news yesterday. Yeah. Um, but I know one of the things that we, um, we talked about with this was, um, Losing my train of thought. Well, there, there were two things that they talked about just to answer that question. There were yeah. two things that they talked about. They provide all the literature information to send you and, and educate, and it would be the passport. It would also be the European Union having the uh, the travel yes. uh, registration done. Okay. Yes. That kind yeah. of stuff. So I, I don't mean to throw a monkey wrench in yeah. here, but it might it feels like we're discussing the logistics of this where I don't know why we're doing this and right. how it aligns <laughs> with Continue on, yes. Hang on, I just want to finish yep. my point, okay? <laughs> so how it aligns with the educational mission yep. of the school and how it will benefit our students. So it's like I almost for me, it's hard to get into all of this. So I wanna know the why. Sure. You know, why why we're doing this. And then maybe get into the challenges. But first, is this something we want to do? Will it benefit our students? Okay, so, All right, so, so let's get through. Usually, I was expecting you guys to want to know the logistics and not want to listen no, to the fun big stuff, picture. so I take the fun stuff. First. All right, so itinerary. So this is specifically designed, it's specifically but for why? vocational oh, so education. The itinerary answers the why. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yep, yep. Yes. Each one of these yes. itinerary stops ties, ties into, into our into curriculum. what we do, our curriculum. So we're taking the kids uh, you know, from Massachusetts, from here, from the hill towns, from Worcester County, who knows, that have maybe never even left the state. Um, some have traveled, some have traveled in the United States, maybe they've gone to Canada. We're going to take them, we're going to show them agriculture, we're going to show them farming, and we're going to show them food from another country. We're going to go take a look. It's the Sustainable Agricultural Tour. So we'll fly overnight, we go in, uh, we fly into Milan, and then we, from there, we'll travel to Turin, and if you want to just click through and we can, uh, so we meet up with the tour director, we can click through, we don't need to keep going there, all right, uh, so we'll take a look, we're going to see some of the historic parts of Italy, uh, we're going so there'll be that tour, that kind of aligns on your academic level, your academic standards, your history. Uh, it's I, well, I, I build uh, almost everything that we're great. doing here in terms of culinary. I'll talk yeah. about that piece. Yeah. We, we receive a lot of our product from these locations. Yeah. Okay, this is how it's produced, this is where it comes from. Um, this is how it's sustainable, right? Like, how do we bring these practices back to us? How do we use them? Here, how do you use them in your future? If you're going to open your own business and you want to be sustainable, and the, the national average um, restaurant profit margin right now is 3%. How do you stay in business with a 3% profit margin? Well, you start looking at sustainability, right? You know, you're growing your own herbs, you're, you're, you have your own chickens, you're doing whatever you can to, to cut the middleman out. I think that this ties directly into it. I've never been on one of these tours, so I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but when they talk about sustainability and what they've talked to us about, to me it ties directly into the things that we can do, and a lot of the stuff we do here, but showing it on a global level and a global economy, I think is very different. Okay. Does that does that make sense? Is this starting and, to answer your question? And we're expanding. We're what expanding what to it and to each other. How did did so, you find this or did this find you? It came into my email and I was like, and I just looked at it and I was like, what? 
And this is perfect for us. Um, Same and it's, it's perfect. It's perfect for both of us because it is culinary and it is farming and it is agriculture. And we're going to go take a look. So if we want to go to the next one, um, we're going to go to an apple orchard. This is going to relate directly to your horticulture shop, your food shops. Uh, and in this, you're going to learn about how the cattle... My imagination, the way it's described, is I'm thinking we're going to end up going into an orchard and we're going to see them using cattle to graze down the land underneath of the trees to help with uh, weed control and everything rather than out there mowing all the time. Again, sustainable farming, sustainable agriculture. The cows are mowing the lawn, the cows are pooping on it, that's fertilizing it. The kids are going to see this on an international level. Uh, and then they're going to learn about the fruit uh, packaging, how they're washing it, how they're processing it, what happens with the fruit from there. Uh, so, and we're going to... So, so just to butt in and cut yeah, you off no, 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 for a no, second. No. Uh, one of my first questions that came up when, it, when this came to my attention was, what other schools are doing this? Yeah. It, it was one of the big questions I asked. Who else comparable to us is doing this? I want to talk to them. And I want to know if they think that it's valuable. Because I see a lot of value in this. But is it really as valuable as I think it might be? Because sometimes these things can, you know, be a bust. Um, and every school that we've talked to, right. Joe, when we sat there on that Zoom, everybody, it was an overwhelming, like, this is fantastic. Um, I know Mr. Lincoln home to talk to, he, he has experience going on an EF tour. Um, so I don't have experience with this, so it makes it a little bit difficult for me to talk about what we're actually going to see. But I, I think I see the potential. Um, I also see, you know, as somebody that's been here for 19 years, I see a very um, huge difference in our student population and a need for diversity in what we offer them in terms of opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're looking at competitor schools and what they're offering, and they are offering this. They've got students that are going on these tours year after year. Um, we don't have anything that, that comes close to something like this. So maybe this is a first step, and maybe this is it, you know, the, the golden ticket to, to what's fantastic for us as Smith Vocational. Um, but there's definitely a want by parents. There's definitely a want by students. And it definitely ties into what we do, mm -hmm. is what I can tell you standing here today. Thank mm -hmm. you both very much. That, now now yeah. I'm ready to hear mm -hmm. some of the nuts and bolts. And I do also wonder if... Are, are you imagining that the way sustainable farming and the culinary arts are practiced in Europe, are in Italy specifically, are different enough that it's, that, that it's going to open everyone's eyes to what might be possible to bring back here? Or you think, is that I think you're going to see some differences and some similarities. Yeah. I, I would have to imagine. Um, I'm really hopeful. Uh, if we go to the next one, I think it's the next one. Yeah, I'm really hopeful. I'm so hopeful, but they haven't given me a solid answer that we're going to actually end up at a water buffalo farm, which is something that uh, Italy is very well known for because the water buffalo milk is the true milk for making a mozzarella cheese. Uh, so that is how mozzarella cheese became, was from the water buffalo. They used the salt water right from the ocean or right from the sea to... Uh, put the cheese into the brine. So that is a traditional true mozzarella. So I'm just like, we're going to, and I was talking to the school from Tennessee that did this trip, and they said it was a water buffalo farm that they went to with mozzarella and stuff. So I'm very hopeful. So I think that will be really cool. I know one thing, actually culinary and animal science have teamed up in the past. We've made mozzarella with our students, and we've gone to farms here uh, and we weren't using water buffalo. We were not using water buffalo. We were using Asher cow milk, actually. Um, close enough. So, <laughs> uh, you know, so it's different. I mean, we don't have a water buffalo farm. I think the closest one we've got is in Maine. There is a water buffalo farm in Maine. My, I could be wrong, but I, I'm pretty sure there's one in Maine. Other than that, I don't know of where there might be any others. So. This is something that they're known for, but what are they doing? They're still making cheese, and we're, we're making cheese here. We're still raising livestock and cattle for our food, uh, and so we're going to see maybe different livestock, different cattle, different methods of how they're raising them, 
different sustainable methods, but ways that you know the kids can bring back and be like, wow, did you know in Italy? And there might be something we can only do in Italy, but we couldn't do here because our land is different, our weather might be a little different, things like that. And so, you know, expanding the students' horizon and knowledge of, of what is out there and taking them out of their little bubble, I think, is, is one of my huge goals, too. Summarize the rest of the trip? Yes. Um, Again, so then we're going to take, we'll, summarizing it real quick, we're going to walk through some vineyards. Don't worry, we're not going to wineries or anything. We're going to walk through vineyards, see that. We're going to uh, check out some of the olive groves and learn how olive oil is made. There's also going to be no nude beaches. No nude beaches. No, no, we said that's not happening either. Um, and then we continue on. That's the olive grove, the yeah, olive grove wine, um, olive making. There's that. Yeah. <laughs> and then we go to Monaco. Uh, so we do cross over into France. We will uh, take a, a walk along the pier, the bridge, the, not the bridge, the beach there. Um, we will be going to a perfume factory. What is used to make perfume? Agricultural products. Uh, is actually, you know, a lot of your makeup. You might not want to hear this, but makeup. Moisturizers. Yeah, a lot of that general. stuff is, is made from the uh, the renderings from the slaughterhouse. So, yeah, just FYI, if you didn't know, my students all know, and they go, "Oh my God, what's on my face?" Well, <laughs> but it's the truth. So, uh, perfume, makeup, all of that stuff is actually made from agricultural products. So there you have it. So then we leave, we come back. Um, so it, it directly correlates with the agriculture sustainable. I think we've brought a lot of sustainable, especially into our ag programs. We've been teaching a sustainable ag class. That is one of our elective classes that we teach. Um, so we, we like to talk about different and practices. Obviously in culinary, we try and collaborate as much as we can, yes. getting as much you know product from right here on campus as possible um, between you know, bringing the processing cart on campus and processing our own chickens in the past, mm -hmm. um, purchasing cows and pigs and lamb from the farm and getting greens from the greenhouse. So I think that this all ties into sustainability that, mm -hmm. that we already have a, a rich history in. Mm -hmm. And we've opened it up to the whole school to help with making sure we have the numbers to go and to allow, because I mean, we have students that are involved in farming, agriculture, food, that, you know, may not be in one of our shops. I mean, I know a lot of kids that are in the agricultural sector that are not in an ag shop. Mm -hmm. So yeah. and I we, can, we, we can study this, but our kids aren't going to understand the perspective unless they walk in that space. Right. And I think that's really what it, what it comes down yep. to is providing the opportunity uh, to do that. For some, it might be the only trip abroad they ever take. So. Yep. That's true, too. To wrap it up. Okay. Yeah, we're all. Uh, are there any other questions? Any questions? I guess I just have one. When it comes to the fundraising, I don't know if any of the schools talked about this. If a student fundraises and then they don't go, mm -hmm. so it's fine. So, so, so I believe um, that's something that we would probably have to talk about it on an yeah. administrative. We'd have to, yeah, we'd have to. We'd have to have a process. policy in place. Yeah. Um, okay. That that's a great question. And I think I said this in our last meeting. I said we need Crystal here for some of these questions. <laughs> yeah, right. It depends um, how we pose the fundraising. Right. Like other things. Right. If we say that this is fundraising right. for that mm -hmm. that tour and club, yeah. and they participated in the car wash, <laughs> yeah. they're not going to get a percentage back maybe, necessarily. Maybe a, you know, so we just have to be clear on that. that gets used for a different field trip yeah. for that student, or um, you know, whatever. <laughs> I think that's something that as a group we have to come up with a policy for. Right. And if we agree to go forward with it, and thank you both um, for your time, your interest, your attention, asking all the questions, having the meetings, seeking everybody out, doing all of that work ahead of time, which is just the beginning. And if we do end up um, uh, doing this, deciding to participate in this, I would hope that um, really clearly in all of our messaging, we express that every student we will support every student who wants to go, right? That mm -hmm. that language, that we'll, we figure out a way to make sure anybody who wants to go can go. Mm -hmm. Because I know that, I mean, that's what you're trying to do is yeah. make it as inclusive one, one as of possible. Our, one so. of the big pillars of this from uh, an advisor standpoint that we talked about was having mm -hmm. monthly team building meetings and interest meetings, mm -hmm. trying to make sure that we're, we're building a cohesive group that's gonna go um, so that everybody has 
constant communication with us and with fundraising opportunities and with each other so that they know each other when we go um, so that they, they're already bonded in a group. Yeah. I want to thank you for coming in. We, we've got to wrap up because we're going to have a lot on the agenda yep. here tonight. Um, I know you're coming back in January for the boat, mm -hmm. so you've got a period of time there. And uh, we're, we're as excited as you are. It's going to be a great effort for you to put this together. And uh, as part of being chairman of the board, I congratulate you for taking this on. And uh, more to follow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shifting gears. I can't promise a trip to Italy, but <laughs> some up updates on the school. Uh, so again, under instructional leadership, I know it might be a little difficult to see up on the screen, but I just want to give uh, all of you on the board an update. We did finish our freshman exploratory uh, in the middle of December, so the freshmen have been placed. I just want to give a, a quick rundown on shop placements, the numbers. I'm not going to get into detail as far as specific shops, but I want the board to begin to get an awareness of sort of the, the distribution of students and uh, how many shops are full and how many shops are not necessarily full. And, and these are conversations that we've had over the last several years and we're going to probably have more as, as time moves forward and we start talking about uh, other capital projects on campus. So I just want to give a, the board a quick overview. Again, this is 150 students on campus as a freshman, as our full, according to the admissions policy, a full freshman class. Of the 15 programs, nine of them are full. Now that includes AgMEC, and I just want a, a disclaimer with AgMEC, as a board, we, we did agree to not fill at all 12 students uh, with AgMEC. We wanted to sort of, cons not consolidate, but you know, scale back a little bit, really focus on that particular program, making sure that we're supporting the two new instructors in there. Um, but the number that we allotted for AgMEC was full. Um, so they're part of the nine shops that are uh, deemed full of the 15. We have one shop that was 10 to 11 students, so just about full. We have one shop that was 8 to 9 students, so about 3 quarters full. We had three shops uh, that were between 6 and 7 students, and we had one shop that was between 4 and 5 students. Uh, so if you look at you know, across campus of the 15 programs, uh, I would say four shops were you know, either half to below half filled. Um, and I think initially, and I, I know I used to do this, so I can talk about myself. Um, you know, when I would see a shop that is under enrolled, I would start asking questions: Why is that shop not filling? Okay, there's almost a negative connotation toward that particular shop. And, and I just want to step back for a second, and again reinforce the point I've been making to the board over the last several years. When we talk about student enrollment, and we talk about capacity, 600 students next year, we will be fully, fully enrolled if, by having 150 students a year, uh, 600 students on campus, we have 15 programs. To fill 15 programs, we need 720 students on campus. So my point is, mathematically, it's impossible to fill all 15 programs. Uh, that's just, a, it's a fact. Uh, so you see those two reminders there. Again, 150 students per year, 600 students. You know, we're hoping to fill all 15 shops. It's impossible. We can talk about this more. We've talked about it, you know, sort of, you know, when we're looking at our vision and our strategic plan and moving forward. Um, I just put that out there, uh, you know, the numbers are the numbers. Uh, but I think we'll have more conversations, especially as we begin to lead into uh, budget season, you know, talking about big picture and how we all know, you know students drive a budget. So um, any questions on exploratory, just the, the numbers? I'm not here to pick on any particular program. I know that you were, <coughs> you had mentioned about monitoring that, that they are actually grading or, or, uh, the, or questionnaire of the students going through exploratory between the teachers and the student. How, how, how did that come up? As far as? Well, as far as their participation in each class as they went through it. Didn't you get a yeah, little survey or something? Yeah, I, I think the general feedback, this particular freshman class was very strong. I, I think that the, the staff were very pleased uh, with, with the student level. Um, I think 
one of the concerns that we had uh, by having 150 students, basically there's more competition for more, you know, for the seats. Uh, this, this, the number of seats have stayed the same, obviously, with the 15 programs, but now having 150 students, there was more competition. So how is that going to play out? Uh, it played out. We had some concerns about a couple setting districts. Uh, you know, some, some students from particular towns, they're here for particular programs. If they want to get into a program that is uh, offered or offered back in the, in the home district, there's conversations I had to have at the superintendent level. But I was pleasantly surprised how it, it did work out in the fall. Uh, I think the setting districts, for the most part, were very receptive in signing new tuition forms if necessary. Uh, I think there's some education that was involved. Uh, you know, one thing I've realized over the years, uh, this is my seventh year in the seat, and uh, seven years as a superintendent in a particular district is like a, a full career. Uh, so my point is, the superintendents are turning over. Uh, so you know, new superintendents, they're not necessarily aware of sort of the, the exploratory and a lot of the regulations and you know, why are students here, and, you know, how can they stay or not stay. So there's been a lot of education going on in the fall. Uh, but for the most part, I was pleasantly surprised to see how, how it worked. I think the students worked hard, the staff were great. Um, so. The NEAC, I just want to give the board an update on uh, the self-study. So at a recent faculty meeting, uh, the steering committee was able to put forward uh, the foundational elements in the school and community profile. One of the expectations, one of the requirements of the self-study is that uh, as the, the staff are working together on different committees, coming up uh, with sort of a self-study, a self-review on the elements that we're going to be assessed on, uh, we sort of have the data, uh, and we sort of package the data into a narrative form. That narrative had to go back in front of the faculty to make sure that the steering committee wasn't making things up. Okay, did they support what was being said by the steering committee? All of that was approved uh, recently. Uh, the steering committee now is working on uh, the rest of the principles of, the, of effective practice. We have that data that's being sort of uh, compiled into that narrative form that will be hopefully put in front of the faculty relatively soon for a vote. Uh, and all coming to a head in March, uh, we're going to be hosting about eight individuals from all over New England, uh, March 19th and 20th. And uh, just as a reminder to the board, uh, when we say we are hosting eight individuals, that means hotel arrangements, that means food, that means reimbursing mileage, it's money out of the budget. Um, so I just want to forewarn the board on that. Uh, but we are you know, full speed ahead. You know, we're getting uh, close to the finish line. I want to thank all the staff who've been working over the past year in the committees. They've done you know, Omen's work. I want to thank the steering committee. And the fact that the staff uh, did approve what was uh, put forward, I, I think, shows that, that teamwork on from both, both directions. So we're getting there. Yeah, I think last time we talked about NEAAC, I think Mr. Aquadro, you were asking sort of the validity of NEAAC, uh, perfect timing. Uh, the Department of Ed has what they call TFM, it's the Tiered Focused Monitoring. Uh, and uh, just to follow in line with what DESE does all the time, they change the names. Um, we found out today we had an orientation meeting, Mr. Bianca and I, along with Ms. Wansick. Uh, the Department of Ed is dropping Tiered, uh, so this will now in the future be called Focused Monitoring. But basically, it's a review of our special ed practices, procedures, and policies. Uh, there'll be um, a combination of on-site and, and virtual at the beginning of March. So, uh, so March will, will be very busy with, uh, for us hosting DESE and then hosting NEAC. Uh, but basically, their role is to come in, review student records, uh, review policies and procedures around special ed, make sure we're doing what we're supposed to do. Uh, so. And then I just have a picture I, I grabbed off of our face, Facebook page. Uh, I think this was just a fun activity from Ms. Brisbois, uh, Brisbois in, in, in Social Studies. This was a, a Build a Rights Day, and she had her students sort of highlighting various uh, amendments uh, in the Bill of Rights and talking about the impact on students. So uh, it was a great opportunity for the students to sort of you know, really jump into what the Bill of Rights looks like and why and how that impacts the students. So that was great. pulling all the wire and getting all the electrical set up, you know, on the plumbing side, dealing with, you know, obviously, all the plumbing. Uh, HVAC, unfortunately, uh, we've talked about this even with the larger horticulture building, uh, supply chains everywhere, uh, supply chain issues everywhere, uh, we were not exempt from that. We had an issue with uh, the bidding process and trying to get what we wanted uh, for the HVAC system. I want to thank Mr. Smith, uh, sort of working with the engineers and finding a plan B. Uh, and that plan B is allowing us to sort of get back on track. Uh, 
Otherwise, we were going to look at what the end of May was the do delivery. Um, if we were waiting for this particular equipment to the end of May, this project would not be done anytime soon. So, uh, thank you to Mr. Smith and his leadership on uh, finding, finding another path. We're still, uh, ideally, we want it to be done by like now. Uh, we are looking at now trying to finish up that project by the end of the school year, uh, if all goes well. I want to thank uh, the owners of Good Dog Spot. Um, if you're familiar with Good Dog Spot, they have two sites. One happens to be in Northampton. And the owner, the owner came up here for lunch a couple weeks ago and, uh, and just talking about the industry, the, the dog grooming and kenneling industry. We brought him down to do a tour of the building. It was a lot of recommendations on uh, equipment and just sort of fl workflow and whatnot. Uh, so I think we're going to have an invaluable connection and relationship between the school uh, and that particular industry. So. Now moving on to our favorite topic, the horticulture building. Uh, we did not have a building committee meeting today. And also we get into some of the details of why. But the last uh, the last month or so, most of the, the focus from SMMA and uh, the weekly progress meetings has been on site testing. Uh, so we had the existing building. Uh, there was some site testing boring done uh, over the last couple weeks to see if there's any uh, contamination in the soil uh, that would then impact the site. Uh, so we're waiting for those results to come back. Uh, this past Thursday on the 14th, um, our OPM, uh, Craig Wilbur, attended the conservation meeting. That went well. Uh, so we had uh, a lot of site surveying done, uh, outlining wetlands and the buffer zones, and, and I'm learning a lot. Uh, but all of that so far, you know, we, we cleared that hurdle, uh, which is great. One hurdle that we're not quite getting over, uh, which potentially would increase costs with the construction, uh, is around the electrical uh, infrastructure. Uh, so the, the supply that we have down back uh, the electrical engineer um, is sort of concluding that we don't have enough electricity down back to support the new building along with animal science, along with the companion animal building that we're, we're building that will draw off of that same supply in the existing horticulture building. Uh, so they're kind of working through that, uh, but when we look at the potential updated estimate, uh, we'll be looking at potentially some additional costs just to provide adequate electricity down back. Uh, so that was a, a hiccup that we would have dealt with over the last few days. <clears throat> At this stage right now, as you, as you recall, last month the board you voted on approving SD, that was this uh, schematic design that allowed the project to, to at least move forward to this stage. We're into what they call DD, which is design documents. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we failed to realize at the end of December there's a major holiday. And people like to take some time off. Um, and the estimator uh, wants to take some time off. So that sort of delayed this process a little bit. Uh, so we will be preparing the documents to send out to the estimator for a second estimate uh, in the first week of January. So that slight delay, which is why we felt it wasn't really worthwhile having a building committee meeting today, uh, which is also why uh, when we look at your board meeting in January, uh, I'm recommending that we push the board, the board meeting back to the 23rd, basically a week, which allows uh, the estimate to come back it allows us to meet as a building committee, then it allows us to present to the full board to see if we are ready to approve DD. Uh, so that's the recommendation as far as the January board meeting. I'm gonna get into the schedule in a moment, but again, from the board's perspective, um, if you're asked to vote next month on DD, uh, if you approve, that allows us to move into what they call CD, uh, which is construction documents. That's basically those official design documents that we need to have uh, to then go out to bid, uh, and, and you'll see that in the schedule. Uh, you're going to see a lot of overlap in the schedule. You're going to see every little delay is just sort of compounding, okay, uh, with, again, the ultimate goal of being done uh, in the summer of 25. So I thought, you know, we haven't really looked too often uh, at the full board. Uh, I, I did have Deb print the next three slides out. It may be easier, okay, you have the slides in front of you. Or you can look up on the screen. I, I know sometimes the screen is, is very difficult to follow along. Uh, so the first one is sort of the, the current idea of a floor plan. Um, to give you a reference point, okay, the top of the, the page there is, is sort of the football field. To the left would be the existing horticulture building. To the right is the animal science building. Down below, you're sort of getting into uh, that the orchard road down to the orchard, just to kind of orient your, yourself to this particular floor plan. As you can see, it's relatively simple. It's a basic rectangle. 
Uh, main entrance would, would be on the left hand side. Okay, you see the door you're walking in. That yellow is all hallway. So basically as you walk into the main door, on the left would be your classrooms. That's what you see in, in green. We'd have two classrooms. We'd have a simulator classroom. Okay, so the simulators that you'll see later in the, in the presentation. On the right is all the shop space. That's that orange space. Right in the middle, you see that sort of light beige color, that would be the, the instructor's office space. Just beyond the instructor office space, it's, it is in orange, it's part of the shop space, but you see kind of like a little X through it. That would be the climbing structure you know, that we were funding through one of the skills capital grants. You see some storage, you see you know, bathrooms and whatnot. So overall, a very basic design, trying to keep the cost down as much as possible. On the, on the far right hand side, you see sort of these dotted lines. <clears throat> and again, that was the coming to you know, reality that we can't afford everything. And, and that's why we opted to uh, try to maintain the current structure that we have, uh, which is the current garage, the one classroom that remains, the head house, and the greenhouse. You know, uh, you know, we wanted to sort of demo all of that and start new. And we, we just realized we don't have the, the funds for that. So SMMA is, is designing this particular uh, building in that someday down the road, if we have the funds, we could easily expand and include a classroom that we originally had in part of this program was an additional classroom, you cut that out, okay? We can add that classroom back in. We can add the head house back in, and we can add the greenhouse back in. So that's designated by those dotted lines, okay, if that day ever comes in. Uh, so that expansion would be relatively easy, okay, uh, with, with this design. Uh, but at this point, we just don't have those finances uh, to, to cover such construction. <clears throat> Any questions about this concept? The next <clears throat> page and you know the next slide in the presentation is the, the site plan. You know, I've been this has been basically what we've been focusing on over the past month or so. Uh, Berkshire Design is the firm overseeing the site plan. And they've been trying to find ways to cut costs and cut costs and cut costs, uh, understanding the overall uh, budget that we're, we're trying to work with. You can see that dark shaded area, okay, that rectangle, that would be the building. Again, just to the north of that, at the top of the page, that's the football field. Upper left, you can see sort of part of uh, B building. You can sort of see uh, the existing horticulture building to the left of the new structure. Okay. Just kind of orient yourself to, to what we're looking at here. <coughs> That squiggly line uh, would be a, a uh, walkway. So if we currently have a road that goes down to that back parking lot, that road would be disappeared, it would be gone, it would be turned into that walkway. Uh, why it's curved like that is because there is a, a grade down. Okay, you're sort of going downhill a little bit, and we have to uh, respect ADA uh, code. So in case we have a, a student with a wheelchair or a walker, uh, that sidewalk can't be too steep. So kind of doing that strut, you know. Curved line uh, decreases the steepness of that, that particular walkway down to the main entrance. I want to thank uh, the fire chief who reviewed these plans uh, over the past week or so, and uh, he kind of gave his uh, stamp of approval with some feedback. Uh, from his vantage point, that the concern was um, obviously we had a fire. We need to make sure that this new building uh, is accessible by the fire department. So uh, he gave his feedback. The main traffic flow for this, again, because we're eliminating that, that road down to the, the parking lot, the traffic would go around the existing horticulture building. It would sort of go between the horticulture building and the new companion animal building, down behind the old horticulture building, kind of by the MS barn. There's that dirt access road. Basically, that dirt, dirt access road becomes the main access point to get down back. Uh, and you can kind of see that work on this particular site plan. You'd then pull into the back uh, service yard, uh, be on the back side of that, the horticulture building, and also have access to the animal science building. The only addition that uh, from last week to this week after the fire chief looked at this, he wanted to have sort of a, like a roundabout uh, to, to eliminate the possibility of fire trucks having to back out. You know, a fire truck arrives on scene, uh, then when they want to leave, how do, how do they leave? So to the right of that service yard, you see like another dirt road or path, it just sort of connects like a circular traffic flow. So a fire truck can go down there, can get close to the fire, to the building, put out the fire, and then just kind of drive around and back out. So uh, that was a, an easy modification uh, to, to satisfy the fire department's needs. But I just wanted to get, give the board a, a brief 
quick synopsis of what the, the site plan would look like. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about stormwater drainage and, and, and collecting that uh, to, to, to meet those regulations. And, uh, and they're doing, again, Omen's work trying to figure this out under a very, very tight budget. So, so that factor, that would be an access for any emergency vehicle. So Correct. if an ambulance or can also get down there and then would, so would help, if you have an ambulance, you don't want them backing back out, out, you want to make sure that they can get out. That's exactly. Possible. Yeah. The next page, or the next slide, uh, is the, the schedule. And I won't go line by line, uh, but it, obviously feel free to review this and if you have any questions, follow with me. Uh, but we're basically, at this stage, um, we are, well, you know what date it is, you know, we're sort of on that row 22 to 23. You know, so we're ready to submit DD, those are those design documents to the estimator. That's going to happen after the holiday. And then you can sort of see how everything gets bunched up. Uh, there's a lot of reviews and permitting that has to occur. Uh, obviously, the board uh, has to review and approve uh, the design documents, see what the estimate is, um, and, and sort of take the course next steps. And then, you know, as long as, and keep our fingers crossed, as long as we continue to progress, uh, I just want to sort of jump down to <clears throat> under bidding. You'll see that bidding would be going out uh, typically, uh, probably sometime in February, March, somewhere in that range. We would be awarding the contracts for construction in late April and hopefully begin to construct in May. So not a whole lot of time, yet a lot of things to happen. Uh, so I, I know that's one of the big, big concerns that SMA has, is just remaining on schedule. Um, so I put that out there. <coughs> I just want to go back. I think I skipped over a few things. Um, I guess I touched it. Oh, one question that has come up. I think it's come up within the building committee. It may have come up at the full, full board. We've been talking about it in the weekly update meetings. Is the, the, the validity of an independent estimate. Okay, right now, the estimate that was shared with the board last month, you know, that came from uh, SMMA's estimate. They are professionals. This is what they do. Uh, but there might be some validity to have a, a, a second estimator. Uh, you know, give us a, an idea. Are we sort of within the same ballpark? Uh, we are going to get a new estimate, a, a new estimate from the same estimator. You know, but you know, with more current designs, and you know, we're getting closer. So hopefully, it's going to be more accurate. So we will have that in January. Uh, but the question is, should we go out and find our own estimator just to, to compare? Uh, we all agree that. That is valid. Uh, SMMA does recommend that, honestly, and they try to sort of uh, reconcile you know, the differences. It may allow us to find uh, commonalities, or if there's differences, we have to figure out why. Um, I just want to caution the board. I think right now, getting a second estimate might be too premature. Okay, a lot of the estimates are still you know, made up money at this point. But once we get the DD documents, um, we agree that we probably want to have find a second <coughs> estimator to give us an idea. Uh, but we agreed, based on ethics and based on the regulations, uh, we want to pay for a second estimate. Uh, because that estimator may be somebody who might be interested in, in submitting a bid. So for that, that vendor to have access to the bid doc not bid documents, but to have the design documents and have a head start, that could be an ethical violation there. Um, and then also as a reminder as far as donations, you know, we've been uh, advised we are able to receive donations when it comes to the equipment, to material, to supplies, but not to the services. And the, the service of, a, of an estimate would not be allowed as far as a donation. So I just put that out there. Uh, you know, as a board, you can discuss at some point. So I would recommend, you know, we do spend money. I know we have no money to spend. Uh, but it might be in our best interest to find the money uh, and, and spend it on an independent estimate uh, as we get closer to that point. Uh, but I would not be recommending doing that for I just want to put that out there. How much does it cost? I mean, being told about ten thousand. And today's meeting. So again, the, the future estimates. We're going to have one coming up in a few weeks. Okay, so we'll have a, hopefully a better idea. If we go out and hire an independent contractor to give us an estimate, that would be one that we do. 
but SMMA, uh, once we get into those CD, that CD phase, you know, we're creating those final documents so we can go out to bid. Uh, during that process, we'll do a third estimate from SMMA as well. So there'll be checks in, you know, along the way uh, to see if we're, we're on, on pace uh, within the budget and making those decisions. So uh, there are some more checks still along the way. Any other questions about horticulture? Um, do you, uh, the video, the beautiful video that we saw last meeting was posted online, was made available, and there was a wonderful article in the newspaper. Um, what has the response been in terms of um, funds raised from that? I have heard positive responses. I have heard potential. I have not seen, please tell me if I'm wrong, I have not seen a single check. Mm -hmm. It's really a beautiful video. Okay, well, <laughs> for positive responses from people with deep pockets or financial institutions or like the general sentiment, what a beautiful video. And I think there's potential donations. I don't think they are extremely deep pockets. I don't think we're going to see anything on the level of like a Smith College donation. I don't see that happening. I know, excuse me if I could, <clears throat> Mr. Quadra and I have both been shaking the trees around the, the city and uh, Greenfield Savings Bank uh, is in conversation to uh, look at presenting an offer to us for some money. Um, North, North End Lions Club, who we work with very closely with the ski and skid sale they have here, uh, has it on their agenda to uh, look at doing a few thousand dollars to donate here. So <clears throat> there's behind the scenes things that are, are, are working hard to try and collect some more money. And, uh, and again, it's our community effort that, that uh, these banks have uh, heavy competition between each other and they, they are very, uh, compared to the old days I would say, have loosened up to give money to the community to enhance their brand uh, and, and, and participate in helping the community. So uh, that's, that's a plus for us, but uh, it's uh, behind the scenes to pull it, pull it through the guard hose, but then you come out the other end. Just a lot of share that. So moving on to family and community engagement, <clears throat> as is the routine, we sent out the December newsletter. I'll just sc scroll through, and then speaking of that particular video, you know, the focus of my article was on the governance model of the school, and then sort of that transition into the horticulture building and you know why are we in the situation that we're in, and then we posted the video, so people you know, watched the video through the newsletter. Uh, and then we had Mr. Bianca's article, and then we got into the general school-wide information that we shared out. So again, I think this is a, a big step moving in the right direction, better communication. Uh, so it was just another way of getting the word out about hort the horticulture building and, and sharing that video. An update on the, the school-based health center. Uh, I had a meeting last week, I believe it was, and they have, they have moved forward. They have posted for two part-time positions uh, one is a community health worker, one is a behavioral health therapist. Um, there is some interest, not as much interest as they want for both of those positions. Uh, right now, the behavioral health, uh, there is some interest. Uh, the therapist is not overly local, so we're looking at potentially doing uh, like a telehealth, like a remote type of therapy session. Uh, and we're kind of working through the pros and cons and, and the logistics behind that. I want to thank Tom Moore, one of our adjustment counselors. He was on the, on the meeting with me, and uh, you know, he had a, an excellent vantage point to talk about recommendations and advice. And, uh, the Hilltown Health Network is hoping to have services up and running sometime in January, February. Uh, we have a follow-up meeting the first week of January to see where we are. Uh, I came back to the administrative team. Uh, the next step was uh, the administrative team within our staff team. Uh, to begin to identify some students who we thought would be best served having some of these services. Come up with that list when we meet again with the Hilltown group uh, after the holidays. Uh, we would share that list uh, with them. They, they could then begin to reach out to these families 
uh, on our end, we'd be communicating with the families to let them know that we think you'd be an excellent candidate for these services. But again, these services are paid not by school budget money, that they're paid for by insurance. So the Hilltown Health Network would reach out to the families, talk about the insurance, and deal with that paperwork. So then hopefully, again, January, February, we could be up and running. Uh, the community health worker, his or her main focus is not direct therapy, okay, but it's working between the student, the family, and the community, trying to make those connections. So, you know, if you're looking for a pediatrician or an eye doctor or any kind of service out in the community, uh, oftentimes as a, a, a parent, I have no idea where to look. You know, who do I call? Where do I go? And that is the community health worker's job, is to make those connections, uh, which I think it would be invaluable for our students and their families. Um, the website and communications, I just want to bring this up. Uh, you know, this is something that Dr. Spencer Robinson and I have been you know, talking about over the last couple of years. Uh, looking at the website, uh, you know, the website is that first landing page, uh, sort of that first contact that many prospective families have. We just want to make sure that that website is current and it looks from the branding side, uh, it, it, it conveys the message that we are the best school that we are and families want to come here. Uh, so looking at options on, on updating that, uh, I want to thank Mr. Shear, our IT director, giving us some ideas. He's given us some leads. Uh, he actually has taken it upon himself to, he's given me a template to look at if we wanted to redesign the website in-house. So I just wanted to give the board an update there. Uh, there are potential costs, and uh, you know, I would advocate if we go down that road of potential spending some money, you know, there might be ways to find that money maybe within the trustees. So we'll talk about that as we get closer, but I just wanted to update the board on that work. Can I just ask a question in the comment about the um, Hilltown Health Network? I'm so happy to see that this update and that it is happening, yay, Hopefully, to yes. everyone involved or that is, you know, potentially happening. Um, and uh, two questions that I have. One is where will it, they be located on campus? And the other question is um, I, I know that when we visited Gateway's um, Community Health Center, the, the real value in having staff be there long term to develop the relationships with the, fam the students and the families and all of that. Um, so this wouldn't be, this question wouldn't be to replace either of those, but to supplement those two positions. Um, when I worked at, at JFK, uh, we always had interns from Smith College from their school of social work, and they were master's students. And so, um, they were older and they had some experience and closely supervised and I wonder if that would be a potential resource <coughs> for us to tap into to supplement. You know, I'm thinking of those are two part-time positions, right. any more help, something to consider. I'll definitely share that. Yeah. Uh, the where will it be based? Uh, right now the community health worker as a whole they really love the basement of the White House. That, that really did draw them in. There's two large offices down there. Uh, the concern that we have is access, ADA compliant. How does somebody, uh, again, with a wheelchair, walker, cane, or whatever, and get down those stairs is basically impossible. Uh, so we are looking at, at least for the community health worker, we have these two offices here in the library, one we don't really use, so that might be a location for that individual. Uh, the behavioral health, if it's more telehealth, is <coughs> virtual. One of my stipulations was um, feedback that we've heard is that we don't want a student to go through an intensive therapy session uh, and then sort of throw them back to class or shop. You know, there needs to be sort of that touching, you know, that contact with our adjustment counselors, our school counselors. Uh, and this was the idea from Tom Moore, I loved it. You know, we have that beautiful guidance suite. Uh, that the, the counselors are not glued to their office. Oftentimes they're out and about. And uh, if the scheduling would go through Ms. Kelly, the administrative assistant within guidance, you know, we could schedule those offices, make sure that they're available. And then it's obviously a, a safe place, it's confidential, and that, that student would have contact with the adult you know, as he or she was coming in for the, the session and then leaving. Uh, so I think <coughs> part of the therapy sessions it probably makes the most sense and guidance for the, for the time being. Uh, as we expand, again, we keep talking about this office and we keep talking about the basement. Uh, I, I've shared with uh, the Hilltown Health Network about potential trailer space, and you know, we'll see what I'm talking about. At least maybe we can get this off the ground. Professional culture, I just want to highlight uh, ACTE. Uh, this was out in Phoenix uh, at the beginning of December. 
I, I listed the, the sessions I attended. I'm not going to go line by line, uh, but you'll see some sort of themes. Um, I do want to just highlight Morris Morrison. Uh, he was the keynote kicked it off. Uh, you know, when you get to that level of a conference, the keynotes are obviously top notch, and his story was was profound. Uh, I'm not sure there's a dry eye uh, in the, the conference area. Uh, he is a uh, he was adopted uh, twice, so that tells you part of his upbringing. I uh, grew up in New York. Uh, mother was a prostitute. The father was sort of the the kingpin, you know, sort of overseeing that, that operation. So that was his, his upbringing. Um, his theme, though, was around music. And, and you can imagine a, you know, a young male growing up in, in New York City, music was his everything. And rap was his, his genre of choice. Um, then he kind of talked about his exposure to country music and how he was sort of anti-country music because country music wasn't for him. Uh, and when, you know, by default, he listened to his first country song and he hated to admit it, but it wasn't that bad. You know, so he sort of used this, this notion, this argument of we're always set in our ways, we always have our own beliefs, we all have our own practices and whatever, and how do we step out of that comfort zone and allow ourselves to experience something new? And when we experience something new, you have no idea what that's going to bring you in life. You know, so he sort of used that metaphor of music uh, as, as sort of his message, and it was, it was very powerful. Um, if you have, I think he has a few books out there. Feel free to buy the books and read. Um, great gentleman, great story. Uh, but then when we got into the sessions and you know, talking about AI, uh, that was sort of the overarching theme throughout. I went to a few sessions on AI. Very interesting. One term that I've learned is uh, uh, AI, ChatGPT, as one tool. Uh, they have something called uh, it will hallucinate. Okay, now I, I know what hallucinations are. Um, that's when you see things that aren't there. Well, ChatGPT and, and AI in, in general can hallucinate. And uh, it happened to me twice. Uh, you know, when I was out there, I tried the recommendations. And one was the article I shared in, in the newsletter, okay, uh, when I'm talking about the school governance model. I went to ChatGPT and I said, please give me a 300 word narrative or a 500 word narrative on the Smith Vocational and Agricultural Governance Model. That's what I asked uh, ChatGPT to spit out. And you know, what it spit out was total garbage. It was inaccurate, not one truth whatsoever. Totally made up. Uh, so that was sort of eye-opening for me. The second one, when I was out at uh, ACT, they said, uh, go into ChatGPT and ask it to give you your biography. So I did. I went in and said, please give me a biography on Angel Lincoln Hooker. And I read about myself, and that was not me. Not one iota. Um, so again, the notion is, you know, and, and we learned it as the board, you know, down at the, at the Cape. Right. You know, the, the programming behind it, uh, I saw it in, in reality. So, you know, the learning moment for me is you, just, you simply can't rely on it as a tool and just use it and, and, and you're done. You have to review everything. Uh, I think it's a great starting point. Um, I think it's a, a wonderful tool. But anyways, uh, that was a big thing. And the other one was sort of in, in the screenshot you see there. It's the shortage of finding teachers, quality teachers. We cannot find vocational educators anywhere in the country. It's next to impossible. Uh, that one particular workshop I went in, uh, where I took that picture, it was trying to diversify your workforce. So how do you find uh, teachers of color? Uh, how do you attract them? How do you motivate them? How do, you, you know, how do we do a better job with the diversity within the teaching ranks? Uh, and they had a lot of great recommendations in that particular workshop. Uh, so, again, by far, I think it was one of the best conferences I've been to. Uh, that photo, I have to credit Mr. Brewer. Uh, he was one of the attendees, and we did a sunset hike up in the mountains outside of Phoenix. And I told Mr. Brewer, he actually provided all the attendees. That photo, he blew up to an 8x10. Uh, it's in my office now, so we, we each have it. I told Mr. Brewer, you know, if, if teaching doesn't pan out for him, I think he has a future in photography. So, uh, anyways, it was a beautiful, beautiful hike. And then uh, donations, uh, we did receive 146 board feet of rough cut maple uh, from Eva Shokin uh, for cabinet making so the students can make some projects, uh, which is great. And then lastly, in the news, and I can, you can't read these, but most likely you've seen these three articles. Uh, one I just want to sort of highlight, it's, it's kind of interesting, it was 10 years ago at the former mayor, um, sort of pulled back the, the notion of consolidating okay, and making Smith Focus part of NPS pulled that, that notion back and said, but we need help from the state. 
Okay, so you know we won't push the consolidation, but we need help from the state to figure things out when it comes to the buildings. That was 10 years ago, and we're having the same conversation nowadays. So I thought that was kind of ironic. Uh, the middle article uh, was already mentioned. It was a great Gazette article about the horticulture building and you know, the need for more money, you know, the current status. And then the article on the right uh, was a former grad in cosmetology. Uh, he was a Florence, uh, born and raised in Florence, and now he has his own salon here in the city. So and again, another great success story. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through, but a lot of meetings coming up. Okay. Uh, if you're unaware, there's no school next week, uh, and then there's no school in January. Martin Luther King will be a long weekend uh, as well. So, but again, when you get the minutes, you can review all those minutes. With that, I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal. Uh, yes, sir. I'm going to have to pass this off. I didn't have a chance prior. You just take one. Um, yeah, so uh, Dr. Lincoln over did mention that Lily Hughes, um, I did want to just share some information that she sent along, um, but she was able to get uh, two bins of donations, um, which will go to the Northampton Survival Center, and uh, so there is a, a PowerPoint that I think you'll make available with the minutes for them um, that does go through what she intended to share with you this evening. Uh, so I do encourage you to look at that when you receive it. Um, <clears throat> and I want to thank her. Uh, you know, Lily did apply to be a part of the Principal's Youth Advisory Committee. Um, she wasn't selected, but she did. I did encourage her to continue to find ways in the school to be a part of leadership. And um, she took me up on that and asked about the food drive and uh, was able to work with her at the end of October, early November, to help her set that up. Majority of the work was done by her, so really proud of the efforts that, that she gave. Um, <clears throat> our student reps couldn't be here today. Dom couldn't, uh, Brandon couldn't be here. Dominic is playing a basketball game as we speak over in our gym. Uh, you can see our enrollment, our admissions update. We're at 198 applications. That's 20.2% from Northampton. You can see year over year we are tracking ahead. Um, Dr. Lingenoger did mention about the freshman placements. There you can see the actual numbers. The ones in bold are the programs that uh, filled to the number that we have as a cap. Our school council did meet earlier today. We discussed the update on the, program, the progress of our school improvement goals, and we will begin the student handbook review process um, moving forward in the January, February timeline. Youth Advisory met again on November 15th. Uh, we discussed planning around the idea for a Positive Choices Month. That's sort of just the title I gave it. We haven't come up with a, a, a title necessarily for it at this point. Um, but if you remember from the last meeting, uh, we are reflecting on the spiffy data that came, that was given us, and, and looking at the at-risk behaviors, specifically the ones that our students uh, are doing at a higher rate than Hampshire County. So we're looking at those things. Um, what the students are hoping to <coughs> try to give them a little bit, a lot of flexibility around this. Um, but in presentations, outreach, social media posts, and announcements, weekly announcements centered on educating our students about positive choices when it comes to relationships and substance abuse as well as school culture. Um, our next meeting is tomorrow. Spirit Week will take place when we return from break, January 2nd through the 5th. We're going to have daily themes for to build camaraderie, and it'll culminate with our annual traditional shop dodgeball tournament on that Friday, uh, which is something that all the students look forward to at this point. Budget, we have been getting the building level budget proposals by departments. They're due on Thursday. Uh, we'll review those in individual department meetings uh, with department heads combined with into one proposal for Dr. Lincoln Hoker. Uh, that will incorporate into his budget uh, to the Board of Trustees. And those meetings with those departments will take place the second, third weeks in January and into the last week if necessary. Um, I apologize, school council ended up there twice. Monty's March, just want to highlight that we continue to work with, um, it's not really called Monty's March anymore, but it's the March for to end hunger, I believe. But it was traditionally Monty's March, and our uh, collision repair instructor, Mike Brooks, really was able to build a relationship with Monty Belmonte um, when he started that at his other employment. 
Uh, this year, they, as far as right now, I think they're at 450,000, but uh, we won't know the final number until after the end of the new year. But just for the boards, uh, our students are the ones that build the carts, repair them, um, and uh, I believe the original cart is going to get hung in the new building uh, from the ceiling. So that'll be really interesting. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So they continue to do that, and not only that, but Mike Brooks and this year Chris Richards in Collision Repair, um, they actually transport all those carts to the start point. They, they go at the end of the night and they fix or um, sort of, you know, go through and do lube in the tires and make sure everything's fixed at the end of that first night so that he's ready to go the second day. Uh, and then they go and they pick up all that stuff, and that's completely volunteer time on their part that they like being a part of this cause. Uh, and it's good for our students. Toy drive, we did our annual toy drive again this year. Um, and that's sponsored by Emily Dumas and the National Honor Society. We gave over 50 toys or donated uh, to Northampton Fire Department. Uh, personnel were still posted for a health assisting instructor. Uh, and we did have an English teacher that uh, is resigning at the end of January. Uh, we'll be moving out of state. Uh, so we do have a posting out for a long-term sub. And pending your questions, that's my report. Um, thank you, super informative. Um, I am looking at the number of four students in cosmetology mm -hmm. um, and being reminded of um, Putnam, what I learned at Putnam, that in um, some of their shops are um, every other year, so they essentially retain one instructor yeah. and then do 9, 11, and 10, 12. So something for us to think about is, you know, Dr. Lincoln Hooker mentioned, we, we can't, uh, theoretically we can't accept we can't admit the number of students to bring all of our shops to capacity with 15 yeah. shops, and so a way to still have as many options, mm -hmm. but you know, yeah, make it make it like an every other year option. Yeah, and I, I will say though, um, cosmetology filled last year with 12. Yeah. Horticulture filled last year. Yeah. Uh, graphics had a higher level last year, so there is some um, cyclicalness yeah. to the student interest. Yeah, and, things. and it's just there's some yeah. variability, I think. Um, are Brandon and Dom on your youth advisory? Yes, they also sit on that. Yeah, so it's two members from uh, each grade, and then the two board of trustees reps sit on that. Gotcha. And um, what are the parameters that you provide to the department heads with regard to the budget? Um, so there's a, a, a budget uh, form that they fill out. Each, each there's broken up into sections like, do you need textbooks? Are you looking for materials? Are you looking for training, uh, certifications? Um, is there additional needs maybe around staff or personnel? And what we really ask for them at this point, <clears throat> the process has always kind of been, to use your word earlier, aspirational. Mm -hmm. So it's really about, tell us what it is that you are looking for in all areas. Um, I know other school systems might do it and say, uh, tell us your costs or they, you know, you're, you're gonna get a level funded or they may come back and say cut 10%. We've always tried to do it in a best case scenario and then see what we can fund. And what I like about that is that we are able to have additional funding sources uh, that might be able to cover books at the end of the year where we can pre-buy or we can have a separate funds for those. Um, we also are able to identify things uh, like equipment or other things that we might be able to get through grants or Perkins, just because we couldn't fund it during the actual budget building process, it creates sort of a catalog of items uh, that we consistently come back to and, and work with those department heads and, and identify and earmark um, those things. Sometimes there's funds that the state releases that we're able to use, and then we know that there might be additional grant money uh, that we can use, so we might go after textbooks, we might go after other materials, we might go after equipment. Uh, so it's really good to have that stuff. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think overall the feedback's been good. I think some people might look at it and be disappointed. We asked for all this stuff and we didn't get it. But it really goes into these lists and categories um, that I, I'm sure we could go back and run the data. I think at the end of the day we're probably fulfilling 75, 80 percent or more of those requests That's through other cool. funds and, yeah. and through other ways. So and it's and once you know what you're trying to look for, it helps us go out and find that money. Right, right, and it seems like it's organic where you're asking, the, asking them to identify. You're not, you're not limiting or saying, oh, it's 
you know, this department's this year, it's their turn for whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, you just are saying, what are your needs? And then yeah. we're going to try to meet as many of them as we can. Yeah. Thank you. Committee reports? We had a policy subcommittee meeting uh, recently. <coughs> sure, Dr. I will pick it up. Um, the policy subcommittee has met twice since our last trustees meeting. Um, at our first meeting on November 17th, we identified the policies that we thought needed attention, prioritized them in order of importance, and determined the school and district leaders we wanted to invite to subsequent meetings to include them in the review process of policies rele relevant to their rules. Um, these are the policies we'll be reviewing in their chronological order. Conference food reimbursement, which we're bringing to you tonight for your consideration and a possible vote. Parent guardian communication, parent guardian opt-out rights, acquisition of library materials, graduation requirements, longevity for all employees, sick time and the sick bank, and a general policy manual review and update at the end of the year. At our meeting on December 15th, we were joined by Rebecca Wanzik, Joe Bianco, Mike Parks, and Leslie Scants Hodgson, and we discussed the parent guardian and library policies. We will be gathering more information about these um, before we bring them to you. Thank you. Uh, Tim, facilities? Yeah. Um, John, just going on what Andy was saying about the companion animal building, so the kids are still working on roughing in electrical and plumbing. And the cost of copper pipe and cast iron pipe is extraordinary at high. They keep going to the supply house and I'm, they keep trying to slow them down. Uh, but, it, but they got to do it. So even the light fixtures are more expensive. We got to talk about that tomorrow. I'm trying to get these just eight foot LED pendant lights for the cathedral rooms is a, is a, is a huge cost. So. Um, but hopefully starting this Saturday, we're going to start bringing power over there, cutting into the uh, distribution panel and getting the transformer in there next week and putting in some panels so, so when the kids come back, they can start um, dropping the wires into the breaker panels. Um, currently, we're out to advertising to put the new sewer lines out back. Two, two manholes uh, run out of that building, fix the MS barns, uh, chronic problem, the sanitary line coming out of there. So. Hopefully we don't have a hard freeze and the guys can still do it, but that's what that's what we're looking at right now. Excellent. Thank you. Were we impacted at all by all that rain and flooding that hit the city so hard? Nope, so but I did see the pipe out there start to drain into our field. I got pictures of it if you want. So. Yeah, maybe. Maybe what are your thoughts about that? As long as the the stream bank doesn't erode and keep taking away our our pasture. Mm -hmm. And how does it look so far? Um, Too early to tell? Or? No, so the city hired uh, an engineering company. They put some markers out originally, so they come and just check those. But, but in 26 years I've been here, we've moved the fence line back three times, you know. Just, I mean, the, the, the stream is moving. Yeah. Um, there is a, a sewer line that runs right down the middle of it, or it cuts out, so it's, it kind of makes the erosion a little worse in spots. Do you think the system they installed to dissipate the energy of the rushing water is adequate and working? Um, and that scouring? I'd have to go on the end. I can show you the picture. It looks like there's a new stream running right through our pasture when it's running. So, so is that a no? <clears throat> I wish it wasn't there, but uh, I'd have, you'd have to go down and check it. Yeah, ultimately, is how does it how does it affect the stream bed when it, when it goes over the bank? Yeah. Okay. So, thing is, when when you get all that rain, the ground's super saturated. Yeah. It's just going to run on top of the, on the yeah. ground. It's not going to sink in at all. It's just going to run as fast as it can. Yeah. So once it comes out of that holding area, it's on its way. So. Crystal. Okay. Crystal. So I am. Um, very happy to report. In the past few years, the business office has um, experienced a few uh, staff that have been out um, for a nice uh, length of time. So I'm happy to report that we are back to full staff, which is wonderful. Um, currently, with the 
um, operating budget where there's nothing concerning with expenses. Um, the, as Mr. Bianca's um, talked about the budget forms, so I'm beginning to put those together um, and we create a binder for each, um, each administrator, um, depending on what roles they have in Mr. Parks and um, Ms. Charter, if they get separate vocational and academic. Um, yeah, so we'll prepare that and send that out to everybody to prepare for the meetings. I, I do want to say that one of those, one thing that um, Mr. Bianca and I also use that when we start looking at a wish list for Dr. Lincoln Helper for the end of the fiscal year, if there's time that we have additional funds that we can use, we can use those funds as well to help um, with the priority things. It's, I, I think it's been super helpful. Um, the school lunch program. So it's called the community of eligibility provision. And previously, what would happen is parents would fill out the, the free and reduced forms, um, and that would determine the percentage. Um, the percentage level was 40% at one time. If you were over 40%, <coughs> you qualified for free um, um, free lunches for the whole district. Um, they did change that to 25%. So we were previous, previously around 37%. We, we were wavering like very close. They change a percentage to 25%. What that does is, as we all know, that um, gives us the opportunity to provide um, free breakfast and lunch, even though the state did mandate it. So the good thing, um, during MASBO, one of our um, our last meeting, Rob Leshen, he's the director of um, nutrition services, he did present and was just explaining to us how important it is to make sure that when we, that school districts get to that level because instead of the state funding these and re reimbursing, it comes from the USDA, which gives us the opportunity, the state, obviously, opportunity um, to use funds elsewhere. So um, I'm happy to report that I did receive the application for the credit card, so that's very exciting. Um, we will have to add that to the list uh, for the policies committee to, um, to review and put forward to the board. Um, scale and auditors are we're here today, and uh, um, he'll be back tomorrow to audit the FY23 grants. Um, one item that came across my email today was unemployment. Uh, so the city applies for a seasonal designation for um, the athletic for sports, and we are normally awarded um, approved. Um, this time it came back to mm. for several for the. Uh, pretty much all of them except one for the spring. And what they are currently doing, um, um, they are, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I know, that, that's, um, they are currently looking at the whole season. Instead of looking at it where it was determined by each, you know, each um, winter and fall, uh, fall, winter, and spring, they're now taking it, and it's based on the 20 weeks. So that's why what could happen is any potential um, coach could apply for unemployment, which of course, that's very alarming. Um, um, our Chad, the uh, HR director, he is, has already um, filed an appeal. So I would definitely keep everyone updated because that will be um, a cost, definitely a cost. And more so, as we were talking earlier today, you know, when we have internal Coaches are also teaching or whatever. Uh, most likely, this is a minimal impact on those individuals. But if we have an outside uh, coach coming in, that's where we may get hit with that point. So, mm -hmm. not that we want to prioritize until we can but that might be an indirect decision. And I did pose that question as well. So, if we do have a, a coach that's here on staff, and they, or as, you know, as another, to fill another role, and they do coach, can they, do they qualify? So there's just a question, um, Chad did, that is something Chad is also asking about. Thank you. Okay, new business. We have a motion and a second to approve the payment of <clears throat> FY23 invoice to Orchard Electric for $428 from facilities revolving. So moved. Second. Any additional discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. We have a motion and a second to approve for discussion when possible action, a vote, 
on electronic approval of the warrants procedure. Second. Is there additional discussion? Yes. Thank you. Um, the mayor had a concern that our current process for electronic approval of warrants might constitute deliberation and therefore be a violation of open meeting law. Um, I contacted the city solicitor, Alan Seawald, for guidance. In his opinion, our process does not meet the uh, requirements of the open meeting law. No governmental body is permitted to deliberate or take action on a matter within its jurisdiction by email. The legislature has accounted for this by allowing the body to designate one member to approve warrants. And Attorney Seawalt's advice is to have us designate one member to approve the warrants and then to place them in the packet for the next meeting. After that email exchange, I attended the collaborative board meeting that I reported on at the beginning of the meeting, um, where I did an infor informal survey of the representatives present about their warrant signing process. I had them all in the room say, hey, what is your process? And every single one of them said they sign warrants electronically. They don't have a single designated signer. They all reported that warrants required approval from two school committee members, so I was surprised to learn that. Um, I shared that information with the mayor and the city solicitor and Dr. Lincoln Hoker um, and asked about the MPS process. They have one school committee member um, who's appointed to sign warrants and there's an alternate if the signer is unavailable and they're still done in person. So we may have gotten some different information from different sources which led us to do what um, we what we're currently doing. doing. Yeah. Also, MASC is very clear about it. Right. So you shared those with me, which I also have your people want to, yeah. Which I thought that was very interesting to be in that room with all those other school committee members. And just to be clear, there's also, a, it's a hybrid meeting, so there was a screen full of virtual members, but there were a bunch of people in person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You recommend tabling that? No, I recommend that um, that we designate one person to sign the warrants and then sign all the warrants and then a second person as an alternate if the first person is unavailable to sign and that all of the warrants that are signed are part of our board packets at the next meeting. So, right, so you're following what Alan said. Right, and okay. MASC and, and MPS does. Do you have more that you want to add to that? No, that's just the MASC is very clear that it needs to be a single person. And just sort of maybe a little bit more of an explanation from the solicitor is once you, um, if even if you had two people, that would be considered a subcommittee of the entire committee, which then would be subject to the review, which is why it can't be more. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would recommend. Yeah. Um, so I, we have. We don't have a motion for a vote on it, but that I would move that we designate one person to sign the warrants and a second person as an alternate. So do we need a name or do I just designate one person? Um, I, does the chair designate all subcommittees? I can't, I don't, I so. yeah, so then you would designate somebody. Yeah. So we recommend that you designate. Okay. And an alternate. So, are you first? Or am I doing it? I'm doing this. But they could still be done electronically. Oh. Electronically. Okay. Yeah. Oh. But so, then everything we're getting electronically, and you're asking for two trustees to approve. So, just one. What, what's going to be What we've been doing. Yeah. Okay. And so, those packets mm -hmm. are now going to be. We're going to get that whole packet not, of do they need to be printed, or what printed. you would call a batch. You know, we get Correct. the email, Correct. batch number, whatever, right. blah, blah, blah. But not, not, so like we had when we went in and signed in person, yeah. they would be here that we could look through. So I don't think there'd be one for every single person. Do they do that? For no, well, we upload our stuff to, um, you know, um, electronically <sighs> so people can look. We don't print. Because that, that would be a, a waste of... So we can keep, so we, everybody can keep signing them up, seeing them electronically, but not until after the next, after the trustees meeting? Um, yes, so they would be, so they would appear on the packet, or when, you know, maybe when the agenda gets sent, they would be attached with the agenda as, okay. a, as another document that had them all in one document. It would probably be easier. Gotcha. 
Does that make sense to you? Yep. So I designate the previous but to Raffleton as the signee for the warrants, and I would be happy to be second. Okay. All right. So we're we're are we going to see them as they're generated? Like we every couple days, you send out no. three or four. Because that's a violation so, of what we mean. Okay. Okay. I'm just trying to. Yeah get this straight in my head. So I'll be the only one, if I'm understanding this right, I will be the only one to see them. And if something happens and I can't get, I can't, you know, whatever, I can't don't have access to email or something, then Mike will be the only one who sees them until And then Deb they get sends, approved. Until, right, and approve, approve, approve. And then Deb sends out our packets in advance of the meeting. Okay. We'll get all of those warrants in one, I'm hearing the mayor saying one document. All at once. I think it's really make it easier. Yeah. Is that how complicated is that on your end? Is it electronically, or will it be in electronically? Person? Electronically. And how? So. So you still can send. Excuse me. I, I'm assuming you still can send out the batch, what you call a batch, saying you need approval. It will go to Julie. Yeah. She will sign off on it if she can't. I guess we'll notify you to reach out to Michael. Okay, right on. Right? Yep. Okay. And then we get these in our electronic package for some time for the next meeting. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. With the agenda. That's what we're doing. Okay. Yep. And then we So you basically can keep doing what you've been doing. It's just we just don't need to include everyone. Right. We just don't need to include right. everyone. Okay. Okay. Right? Yes. All right. So motion. Ready? Yes. Motion to designate Dr. Julie Spencer Robinson to approve warrants and alternate Michael Callahan. <laughs> Thank you. So, is there any additional you discussion? Yes. You need a second. Second. Now we Is there any additional discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. From the policy subcommittee, may I have a motion or second to approve the updates to the travel reimbursement policy? So moved. need a second? <laughs> what are the updates? We're going to review them right now. Okay. Second. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lincoln Hooker. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, technically it's an update because uh, working within the policy subcommittee, we have a uh, policy DKC, uh, the board policy manual, and that was more very generic. Uh, it was reimbursement policy, uh, but it's sort of out of date. So what we did was we, we used DKC and we modified the city policy around reimbursements and travel. Uh, so what you see here is really modeled out the city policy. And I will highlight sort of the differences and why we recommending that we do deviate from the city policy. Uh, so the opening, uh, and this has been vetted by the, the administrative team, obviously it went through the policy subcommittee. So what you see here, you know, all, the, all the, the administrators had eyes on and, and some quality feedback. Uh, we want to make sure the opening paragraph talks about written administrative approval. Uh, and we, we put that in there because we want to ensure uh, if a staff person comes forward to say, I want to go to this particular workshop or this particular conference, uh, we can approve that, obviously, uh, but we may not necessarily approve all of the costs associated with that. So we may say, you know, we, we will cover the registration, but we're not going to cover mileage, or we're not going to cover it. Like, as the administrative team, we, we have to provide that approval process. So it's not just an automatic. So that's what that opening paragraph is talking about. Uh, it's just, just ensuring that there's approval ahead of time. Uh, then it gets into the procedure, uh, which is basically copied from the city. Um, the eligible expenses it is very, very similar to the city policy. Okay, uh, the, the major de deviation is uh, on the meal reimbursement. And, so, and this is what we want you to consider. To, so right. This is really the crux of okay. Uh, going to many conferences over the years and, and getting feedback from people who go to the conferences, uh, the issue at hand was the meal allowance. Uh, so the city policy states uh, you have it per meal. Uh, so in a particular day. Uh, the current policy is $10 for breakfast, $15 for lunch, $25 for dinner. Uh, so a total of $50 in a given day, but that $50 is prescribed by the specific meal. 
the procedure is you collect your itemized receipts, you submit the receipts, okay? uh, tipping is, in, is included uh, under the current policy. But what, what we found is uh, doing it per meal, uh, we felt it wasn't fair to the attendees for the most part. Uh, so uh, if we have professional respect and professional trust for an attendee going to a conference, uh, that individual, as an adult, may not eat breakfast. Now, they just may not be a breakfast eater, uh, as an example. Uh, that means he or she lost the opportunity. That $10 allowance is now off the table. Okay? Uh, and we all know that many times a dinner nowadays is probably going to cost you more than $25. Uh, so the chances are, if, if we as a district is valuing this, you know, the adult going to a conference, uh, and that adult has to eat dinner, most likely, uh, that meal allowance is not going to cover the dinner. The recommendation here is to create a daily allowance, not a per meal allowance. So rather than taking that $50 and breaking it out by meal, uh, that attendee would have the $50 for the day, and how that attendee wishes to divvy up that $50 is up to him or her. Uh, so again, if I'm not a not breakfast eater, that's fine, okay, that $10 could roll into my lunch or, or to my dinner. It just provides more flexibility, more latitude for the attendee, which we think is a, a professional courtesy. Uh, so that's the big change. Honestly, everything else when it comes to the tolls, the airline, the car rental, the lodging, what you see, okay, uh, the verbiage there is copied from the city policy. It really is on the second page talking about the meals, uh, moving to a daily allowance rather than a per meal allowance. The other change was in the tipping. Uh, so currently tipping is allowed under the city policy up to 18%. Uh, and talking to the leadership team, uh, the common current practice is typically a 20% tip, uh, so we are going to allow up to 20% tip. Uh, but keep in mind that the tip is still part of your daily allowance. Right. Uh, so if you're paying a $10 tip, that's 10 of your $50 for the day. That has to be kept in mind. The other deviation from the city policy that we wanted to add in, uh, and this was some great discussion, <clears throat> was around uh, certain conferences uh, handle food one of two ways. Uh, some conferences have a meal as part of the conference, and you pay for it as part of the registration. And in that particular case, uh, the attendee kind of blocks out. Okay, you get that, that free lunch. Okay, you didn't have to pay for it. We didn't have to pay for it as extra. You just we pay for it as part of the conference. Uh, so your fifty dollars might be able to go a little further. Okay, if you go to that particular conference. But on the flip side, there are conferences. Uh, as an example, the joint MAAC MASS conference down in the Cape is a prime example for my summer, the superintendent's conference, where paying for the registration is separate from the meal that they also put on. Uh, so the joint conference down in the Cape, we pay X number of dollars for the registration for the attendees, and then for us to go to the dinner Wednesday night and Thursday night, that's an additional cost for that particular dinner. Uh, what the policy is proposing if we opt, if the attendee opts to attend that meal, and we pay, as a district, we pay for that additional meal, that additional cost is part of the daily allowance. Okay? Um, most likely, in practice, that's, that's probably going to influence people to say, I won't do the conference meal, I'll go out to a restaurant, uh, but that would be up to the attendee. Uh, one caveat that we wanted to put in here to protect the district, if the attendee says, no, I want to have that, that dinner, okay, at the additional cost, so we pay for that, that meal, and then the attendee decides at the conference to blow off that particular meal and go out to a restaurant, that restaurant meal will not be reimbursed because we've already paid for that dinner, okay? So we try to protect the district as well. Uh, so again, very similar to the city policy, the big change was moving to a, just a, a general daily allowance. Uh, the, the protocol is the same, you know, tracking receipts, submitting the receipts, and it was changing the, and the, uh, the tip. And then just detail language because of the conferences that we often attend and uh, dealing with those meals that are part of a conference or not part of a conference. And I will only add that the, um, you know, sort of the impetus for this is that the, these educators are going on their own time. They're leaving their families, they're leaving their responsibilities here for for the benefit of the school and the district, and to extend them the courtesy of some autonomy in terms of how that allowance is spent in the day. In the $50, in practice, uh, as somebody who does go to the conferences, under the current policy of the meal, uh, at the end of the day, I'm still paying for some of my food out of my pocket. Okay, It's not fully reimbursed, it's just the cost of food nowadays. Um, if we move to this daily allowance, the $50, it helps 
but again, chances are, and alcohol is not you know reimbursed for obvious right. reasons. That's it there. Uh, chances are, it may still be difficult to get through a day you know within fifty dollars. But I think we're getting closer. And, and, and as you mentioned, I think it's just out of respect for the attendees. So, okay, so is there any provision? So if an event or something, they're going to something that's like just a you know like a legislative breakfast or something that's really just for part of the day, or if you're traveling and it doesn't encompass, a, you know, you'll have some part of it that won't encompass a full day? Is there anything that's sort of like prorated? Right. For the night. Yeah. Like if you're leaving in the morning and you're getting breakfast, but then you'll be home by, you know, noon, then that would be a $50 day where they're mm -hmm. only available. Yeah, that's a good point. Currently, as, as written, there would not be that provision for like a prorated. Um, I think that's why the city policy is, is written. Do, yeah. do our educators um, go to events like that that are a, a portion of a day? Oftentimes, no. And I'm thinking if I'm attending a, a morning workshop at UMass because uh, the Department of Ed is putting something on, it's, mm -hmm. it's seldom. But I guess it's possible. So do we want to add language that says it's the If you're going to add language, you're going right back to what no, no. I, I don't agree with it. I think that's nickel and diming, my opinion. Just, I mean, the person's taking time out to do these things for the benefit of the school, whatever. They should be taking care of it in some way. And let me get this straight. So, so we you have a fifty dollar daily allowance to spend however you want. The tip part of it's included in that amount. Okay, that's understandable. Um, but then you like the example of the, this recent conference. So we have the dinner included. So does that say that dinner was twenty five dollars? So then we only have a twenty five dollar daily allowance. Yes. I don't necessarily buy that, but but, then, but they can opt out of that dinner. Yeah, yeah. That's a choice. So they can say, no, I don't want that conference dinner. I want to go out on my own. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I understand the part that he. So you go out on your, you opted for the for the conference dinner. You go out on your own. You're not going to get reimbursed for your own meal. If that makes sense. Right. Um, and the conference dinner has already yeah paid. yeah already been paid for absolutely yeah. back to the mayor's comment um, and I think that's a fair point I guess I would say the prior written approval could cover that uh, so there are again conferences where we we put a call out if you're if you're interested please let us know if you want to go we're not going to cover X Y and Z as part of this policy so we could say that if we know that this particular workshop or whatever is only in the morning. Mm -hmm. Now, part of that approval could be uh, if you're looking for breakfast, we'll cover breakfast, but we're not going to, don't stay out, you need to get back to work. Uh, we're not going to cover a lunch or dinner. So I think there's a way through the approval process. But then how much would breakfast be allocated for? Because you've now taken out those differentiations between those meals. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, can we? I'm having uh, a time issue. I have an MRI in Springfield at 730. Ooh. I didn't think we were I should have mentioned that earlier. Um, Looking at the agenda, I thought we'd get through this, but we got this executive session. I'm going to have to excuse myself. Okay. Yes. All right. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's finish. So up let's finish this, up. this one up. So as far as the policy subcommittee, we've already had a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Well, it's. It, I mean, I. I've just <laughs> suggested some things that you might want to think about in, in, in terms of an amendment of policy. Or, just, mm -hmm. or you, could, you could try it out for a bit and see how it goes. And see if those, the contingencies should be included in this policy right. or if we're okay without it. We're, I like we're, that idea. We will become an overseer mm -hmm. to oversee this situation. So, not hearing any additional discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Mr. 
Mr. Carter, you're excused. Yes. Um, would we'll we'll right. we'll 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 right. we'll we'll be all right? Okay. No, thank you. The chairman already left, so uh, I'm going to read the chair moves to enter into executive session under Massachusetts General Law Open Meeting Law, Chapter 30A, Section 21A, <coughs> to, to conduct contract negotiations with non union personnel, <coughs> civil business administrator, and to reconvene an open session for possible action. May I have a second? Second. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Kaling. Present. Dr. Spencer Robinson here. Mayor Ciara. Uh, yes. Dr. Bonner. Present. We're live. So the chair requests a motion to second to approve the three year 24 through 27 contract of the school business administrator and a roll call vote. So moved. Second. Okay. So now we have Mr. Kaling. Yes. Mr. Bonner. Yes. Dr. Spencer Robinson. Yes. Mayor Ciara. Yes. Dr. Bonner. Yes. Dr. Bader, I need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn.